So our next speaker is Professor Fefe Li, who needs no introduction for people working in AI and the related fields. Fefe is a Sequoia professor in the CS department at Stanford University and then in co-director of Stanford Human Centered AI Institute. Many of us first learned about Fefe's work from her iconic image and ad, her representative research on deep learning, or her popular TED talk that democratized the concept of computer vision. But if you have been following her latest work closely, we all know Fefe has done also a lot of pioneering work on closing the perception action loop and other interdisciplinary topics. For me, there are always endless things that I want to learn from Fefe about how to bring insights to uh, computer vision from other domains, such as cognitive science, machine learning, and robotics, as well as the other way around. So today, she brought us a talk with a super intriguing title. I can't wait for it. Let's welcome Fefe. Thank you. Let me uh, share screen first. Can you see my talk? You can. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, you know it's my first uh, RSS talk, so I'm super excited and. Uh, I uh, want to just start by saying that I very much still feel like a student um, learning the field of robotics and having um, a lot of fun working in robotics with my uh, super amazing students like Quan. So thank you so much. Um, I thought I would uh, give a relatively playful uh, title, but just spend this time sharing some of my thoughts on um, AI vision and robotics. So the title is Octopus, Kittens, and Babies from Seeing to Doing. And uh, the outline is, I'll try to fit in um, two parts in this talk. Um, the first part um, is probably where um, most of you know my work is a brief history of computer vision and uh, connecting why I'm so excited to connecting vision to robotics, why seeing is for doing. And the second part is focusing on a couple of uh, line of recent work in, in my lab and with my collaborators on uh, a, a more vision driven robotics and, and how we can uh, enable vision and uh, uh, hands or grippers to interact with the world. So let's see uh, how far we can get through this uh, ambitious uh, agenda. Of course, um, I'm preaching to the choir. This, uh, I understand this is a, a, a robotics heavy community, but um, many of you are uh, vision and AI experts. And uh, I've been in the field of vision for more than 20 years and it still wakes me up every day with so much excitement. Vision is just fundamentally a cornerstone of intelligence for animals since the, the dawn of uh, evolution as well as for um, very advanced uh, animals like humans, where vision as a sensory system uh, occupies half of the brain, um, um, or, or in a more precise way, half of the brain, cortical brain is involved in visual processing, which is a huge um, real estate to devote to in, in, a, in a highly complex um, neural system. And the reason um, being that vision is very complex and it's so essential in every part of our, our intelligence. So um, as, as Quan said, um, a lot of um, colleagues from other fields of uh, um, AI and machine learning and also the public get to know computer vision's progress recently or, or in the past decade through uh, tasks like ImageNet, where we are as a field collectively able to um, use neural network uh, architecture, especially convolutional neural network architecture to perform uh, actually pretty impressive tasks like 1000 way object classification. And uh, everybody knows that the year 2012 was the beginning of the watershed moment for deep learning because of the Jeff Hinton and students paper on ImageNet challenge. And that brought us uh, what many people, what many people call the deep learning revolution, which is truly a um, um, incredible convergence um, uh, as a result of an incredible convergence of three forces, the computing power, the algorithms, especially neural network and data. And then the world sees 
an explosion in AI um, growth by any measure, whether we're talking about conference attendance, startups, um, markets, and all, all this. But I wanna go back a little bit to um, actually where we came from, because you know we hear all this, but uh, uh, where did all this, why did we come to the year 2012? And uh, what does this mean to our future research direction? And how does that connect to my personal excitement for vision and robotics? So there is a part of the story that is quite well known to everybody is the neuroscience inspired um, neural network uh, algorithm. And that laid the foundation of neural network algorithm. And for those of you who, who, are, familiar, uh, who are new to this, Hubo and Vizo in the late uh, 1950s, two very smart postdocs at Harvard were experimenting with recording cat visual uh, cortex. And they found that this is a um, in the early stage of cat visual processing, um, the, the the neurons uh, respond to simple oriented edges, like what they call oriented bars. And uh, furthermore, uh, Hubo and Vizo found that uh, mammalian using cats visual system is organized in a hierarchical way that information is processed from lower level edge like. Um, information all the way to the more complex object-like information. And that key insight of how visual neural, uh, from neuroscience, how visual pathway is organized in hierarchical way, uh, first of all, won them the Nobel Medicine Prize in uh, 1981, I believe, but more importantly, laid the foundation for a family of algorithm called neural network. In fact, you know, cross-disciplinary science is always where excitement is, even as con uh, concurrent as the cat environment was, uh, cat experiment was going on. Um, computational neuroscientists and computer scientists are already experimenting with that hi hierarchical um, model uh, back in the late 1950s. And of course, the most major breakthrough in terms of a learning rule came in the 1980s. Um, by Ramahart, uh, Hinton, and Williams on um, back propagation. So I think it's fair to say that neuroscience was a major source of uh, inspiration for neural network algorithm. But there is also, it begs the question, what happened between 1986 to um, nine, uh, 2012? It, it's almost 30 years. Um, how come the field collectively in vision and AI and machine learning took that long to get to um, one of the holy grail problems of vision? Is it really just because um, there wasn't enough data or, or um, we're waiting for the GPUs to be invented? So, sorry, the second, the second part of this history, which is in parallel to, to the first part of the history, is actually less, less known to many of the students uh, in the field, which is not just the history of uh, the algorithm, but the history of searching for holy grail problems in science, or sometimes I call the search for North Star problems, is that um, we have this uh, set of incredible tools, but what do we use it for? And this goes back to what vision, the, the history of vision as a field. Again, computer vision started in the same time as the early AI work. Um, Larry Roberts um, is credited, uh, allegedly, for writing the first PhD thesis in computer vision in 1963 on um, basically shape understanding using image analysis um, process. And, um, and of course, you can see this is very synthetic world. It's just, it's, I wouldn't even call this block world to the extent of what block world could be. It's just really a couple of uh, examples and, and, and looking at how edges uh, produce 3D shape. Uh, interesting, Larry Roberts left the field of computer vision and, and contributed greatly in the in advances of uh, the internet later in his career. But uh, 
Um, the field of computer vision began in the 60s and started this long winding journey of searching for its North Star. Of course, I'm not saying there is only one North Star, but it's also true the collective um, community of computer vision spent quite a bit of time uh, trying to understand what are the most foundational problems to work on. And of course, with the inspiration of neuroscience, the first try was edges. People believe um, understanding edges is really important and a lot of papers and conferences were devoted to edges and, and segmentation. It, it continued to be an important problem, but um, that was just one, um, one milestone or, or one part of the search. Another um, important part of the search was um, uh, 3D vision, especially coming from computational geometry and, and those, you know, uh, animal vision, especially stereo animal vision, were able to triangulate the world and understanding depth. So how do we do that in computer vision? So there is a lot of work in, um, in 3D vision, I would say decades of dominating um, topic is 3D vision in computer uh, in computer vision, which brought us important applications like Google Street View and, and so on. And then um, late in the 90s, um, people start, or some early pioneers start to turn their attention to object recognition, but mostly on single object recognition, like this seminal work on SIFT. Some of you old enough like me might remember that SIFT was as hot as uh, deep learning back in the 90s and early 21st century. Um, but that was just searching for the particular teddy bear or a telephone in a picture. So if you look at the distribution of CVPR topics at the turn of the century, it was focusing on low level vision and, and, and so on. And there wasn't much of a um, holy grail or North Star yet. In the meantime, major advances uh, is happening in a sister field that is uh, going to have a profound impact in computer vision and AI. And it's a different branch of neuroscience. It's not neurophysiology like Hubo and Wiesel, but cognitive neuroscience. Just a couple of uh, seminal um, work to show you starting in the 70s, psychologists are showing us that object detection and recognition is a foundational capability of human vision. This is a seminal work from MIT's Molly Potter uh, looking at RSVP uh, technique to show you even with 10 hertz speed, which is 100 millisecond per frame, humans have no problem of detecting a novel object, which I would call a person in the woods, and you will have an understanding immediately of where the person is, what, uh, what the gesture is, even though you've never seen a picture or, or a sequence of frame like this. And then um, cognitive neuroscientist Simon Thorpe and his colleagues uh, did this seminal work in Nature in 1996 showing that the speed of complex object categorization task in human brain can be as fast as 150, 150 milliseconds. I know that for those of you interested, uh, more familiar with transistors, this is not an impressive speed. But those of you who uh, work with animal brains, this is a very, very phenomenal speed. Um, and uh, it also means it doesn't allow too much feedback time for the neural circuitry. And it also shows how innate this capil uh, capability of complex uh, object categorization is. And uh, finally, one last work that I think is foundational and, and uh, very seminal and have a profound impact in the field of computer vision is Nancy Kevinsher and her colleagues at MIT finding that there are devoted brain areas showing that uh, humans can do object categorization, especially things like faces, places, eventually body parts, and so on. So all this incredible work in cognitive neuroscience was actually a quiet revolution that impacted the field of computer vision. It's a revolution that pointed a North Star for computer vision, which is that the problem of object recognition at, a, at the category level is a really important problem to solve. And the field quickly rallied around this problem in the early years of 21st century, meaning um, middle-sized um, 
um, data sets start to appear, especially the Pascal VOC data set that pioneer the way to, uh, for the field to work on the problem of object recognition. And uh, personally, I got into this, of course, through my work with Pietro Perona at, at Caltech at, in my PhD time, but I also got this, um, got into this through another giant in cognitive uh, science, not in the vision field, but in the language field by George Miller at Princeton. And I was a, um, happened to be a, a, a junior faculty there. I learned about his work in organizing the world's concepts through WordNet and pointing out the scale of concepts and, uh, uh, and categories in, in human um, brain or human mind. And that scale is just daunting. And that inspired us to work on this um, image that data set because we saw this is a fundamental North Star for the problem of computer vision. And by putting together ImageNet and ImageNet Challenge, we not only can create a North Star, we can also create a path for the field of computer vision to reach that North Star. And the rest is history. Um, neural network um, um, dominated the, 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 the few years of um, um, ImageNet Challenge uh, result. And these are some of the example winning, early winning uh, architecture of um, image net classification and, and detection tasks from um, the seven layer AlexNet and then GoogleNet, VGGNet, all the way to 151 layer ResNet. And now there's uh, way more, um, um, you know, countless number of architecture in um, um, working on these problems of object recognition and, and detection and, and so on. And personally, um, this success of the field of computer vision on image, net, uh, on image classification also uh, got myself interested in inching toward a dream I had since PhD time, which is storytelling of images. So it's not just enough to give one label to, to a picture like this is a horse carriage or person, but to tell the story. So concurrently, in the um, year around 2015 uh, and, and so on, not only my own lab, but many labs around the world started working on this uh, problem of image captioning, of telling the story of a picture like a man riding a horse drawn carriage down the street to um, longer captions of trying to describe different parts of the image, which we call dense captioning, all the way to paragraph uh, captioning. Um, frankly, I was very surprised myself, even though I work in this, how fast the field uh, was making progress because um, um, the capability of storytelling um, of pictures was such a um, far uh, reaching goal for, for so many years. But in, in, in a few years after ImageNet uh, challenge, uh, quickly the field um, made a lot of progress. So um, we became very unsatisfied with just trying to tell the overall story, uh, most likely by matching some um, um, uh, language patterns. So my students and I started working even deeper into um, image understanding and focusing on relationship understanding. Relationship understanding, um, I don't have time to elaborate on this, but it's also something that cognitive scientists have been uh, looking at for many years and thinks this is a really important uh, capability of human perception, human cognition, and especially for social, uh, um, for social reasons. So we, de um, we put together a new representation, which we call scene graphs, that connects entities, mostly the, the, the objects and subjects of a scene, with their relationships or predicates in the, in the uh, language of um, NLP and um, uh, try to represent a, a very visually rich uh, picture or frame with this kind of scene graph depicting um, the, the relationships and the stories in the scene. Um, I'm not gonna elaborate on this, but a lot of work have followed that um, that line of work, including our own, but also in other labs, using scene graph to compose uh, scene representation or visual representation. And we worked 
we use this very powerful tool on image retrieval, relationship understanding, um, image to scene graph automation, um, sentence to scene graph, uh, as well as uh, um, a, a, a GAN technique from scene graph to images. So there's a lot of fun work we have done this. But I'm not gonna continue to keep talking about this line of work, partially because we start to recognize we're in a, a Plato world, which I call the allegory, uh, which Plato called the allegory of the cave. What is this Plato problem? Well, the Plato problem is um, static vision. Is Plato described the scenario of what vision is, uh, which I actually disagree with Plato now, but at, at the way he described it is vision is, you imagine prisoners being tied down on um, chairs and they're forced to watch a real world play, which was happening behind their head, so that then they're not allowed to turn their head. So all they could see is a 2D projection on the wall of what's going on in the actual 3D uh, play back in their, um, behind them. And they are not even allowed to move around to even experience this fully. So they're these static observers of a world outside of them. And, uh, and, and, and of course, it's a, a impoverished 2D world outside of them. So that's what Plato described as the allegory of the cave problem. And I feel like many of the vision problem we've worked on is sort of in the eyes or in the shoes of these uh, prisoners in the allegory of the ca cave, but real vision is much more active. In fact, real vision is all about being active. So this moved us from thinking about vision in a static way to, uh, to an active way. And this is the, the claim I'm gonna make that seeing is, much of seeing is for doing. So why do I make this claim? Well, first of all, evolution seemed to believe that or, or have proven that. Um, there was a period of Cambrian explosion back in 530 million years ago. Uh, in a very short period of time, lots of species, animal species um, um, evolved within that explosive time, which we zoologists call the big bang of evolution. evolution. And, uh, and it's a puzzle why this happened. Short, a long story short, zoologists, modern zoologists found through fossil studies that it was the onset of sensors, especially vision, but also antennas and tentacles. And that onset of these perceptual um, um, sensors was critical to get the animals moving. And once the animals are moving, they need to evolve because if they don't, they become somebody's dinner. Uh, so it seems vision was driving evolution and or speciation and it was also driving the sophist sophistication of the the intelligence of animals so that's the evolutionary angle there's also the baby angle i did promise baby in my title and many of you i know um that are fans of alison gopnik's work and so am i and she represents a um a um pioneering um group of developmental psychologists, and also she's a philosopher, who are uh, really telling us that early development is very much on the move, it's very much exploratory, it's very much the combination of perception and, um, and action and manipulation and navigation coming together to give the brain the needed do uh, dosage of stimulation. And this has a profound impact in my thinking as well as, um, as many of uh, the people in the field of AI these days. Last but not least, I also want to give another example to try to convince you that vision, seeing, and doing are critical. And this goes to the kittens. This is another thing I promised you in my title. It's the held and hind kittens. Um, in 1960s, in the seminal experiment, which I'm not so sure can pass IRB these days, um, they took two newborn kittens, um, and they put them on a yoke and allow them to move in an environment. But sadly, there is, um, well, sadly for both, they're somewhat confined, but especially sad for the pea kitten, um, if you can see my cursor, 
well, is very much confined to a box that he, it's not allowed to move at all, um, apart from some minimal movement. And then there is this A kitten, uh, as sad as it's on the yoke, it's allowed to drive the yoke. And it's walking, it's turning its head and so on. And uh, after a few weeks, uh, they release the kitten and they realize that developmentally the P kitten was severely lacking in many ways, especially the perception system, but also just severely lacking. Whereas the K A kitten, the active kitten, developed pretty good um, systems both uh, motor-wise as well as perception-wise. So this is a profound experiment that links perception to action or seeing to doing. There is a um, um, bi-directional um, relationship between perception and doing and how we interact with the world. So I want to just um, say that at this point, we strongly believe intelligence emerges from active per perception and interaction with the real world. And with this uh, thesis, we wanna see how far we can push AI system. And uh, to do that, we also, I just wanna highlight a few ingredients of this, uh, um, of this statement of um, active and interactive intelligence. Uh, one is it is embodied and active. Uh, it's simultaneously exploratory and explo uh, exploitative. Did I have a typo here? Um, it's also multimodal. So sensory systems are includes vision, um, um, olfactory, audio, uh, tactile, and so on. It's very much multitask and generalizable, and it's social and interactive. And um, I, I, we're nowhere near covering all these important characteristics of intelligent system, but these are the characteristics that I um, find very exciting and think the uh, direction of AI and robotics research is. So with that, um, I'm just gonna briefly show you three lines of work that our own lab is doing in translating that philosophy of seeing is for doing and, and interaction with the real world into a couple of lines of uh, work in robotics or, 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 um, or RL. Um, the first one is trying to just uh, uh, be inspired by baby actions. This is less of robotics, more um, RL. Um, collaboration with Diane Emmons and, and Nick uh, Haber and uh, student uh, Damien. And uh, the idea is that uh, uh, curiosity drives babies. Um, they, they, they explore the environment so that they can learn. So translating that into um, an AI system, uh, our work uh, tries to uh, uh, learn a self model that, um, that uh, you know, tells the baby or the agent how to explore the world. And then the world model that constantly gets update, uh, updated by the exploration of the self model and, uh, and, and the interrogation of the, of the real world. Um, I, I want to just make sure, given time, I'm not going to be able to call out uh, some of the inspirational work and contemporary work. Uh, I, I'll leave it in the citation section. And uh, uh, here's just the result to show that if you look at the, uh, the, 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 the time axis on the x axis about how the system explores and the y axis is uh, 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 a training loss, you'll see that our self model or the self aware model that's driven by curiosity learning um, learns to um, uh, stage its learning of the world in a very interesting way. It first tries to learn ego motion, so it has high training loss at the beginning and then it, uh, it um, um, it gets it, so the training loss decreases, and then it starts to pay attention to object and start to have a hard time learning object, but it gets it, and then it goes to explore more. So that's the, the, the rough idea of this work. Of course, uh, this is a really uh, high level uh, sketch. Um, another line of work that uh, Kwan um, and I and, and my collaborators, Ryuko, Animesh, and Silvio uh, worked on is actually focusing on interaction with tools. Um, the idea is that tools are really important for, for um, 
humans especially we are uh, almost the only species that can uh, use tools and the only species that can do very sophisticated tool building and, and tool usage. So how do we go from vision to action when it comes to allowing, um, allowing uh, tools, um, uh, an algorithm to learn to use tools, especially the challenges, the high dimensional visual observation is very complex and that's what we care about. We want to do this kind of robotic learning in complex visual world. Well, the, the way we did it is, uh, is um, oops, um, a um, encoder decoder network that transforms um, the high dimensional visual information into uh, maps it to the action. But there is also um, a, uh, a, a real challenge is that how do we um, learn to grasp you know, it's uh, even if we have this visual transformation, it's it's hard to know how to grasp and uh, and and perform the tasks. And a lot of work um, has uh, a lot of people have uh, worked on this. And how do we do this? Um, uh, in this particular particular case, we're demoing that we want the robot not only to uh, grasp the novel object, but also use the object as a tool to perform downstream tasks. And you can see, um, sorry, you can see that um, it's uh, um, the same object can be used in different ways depending on the downstream task. And how do we make that uh, inference? So what we did is to rely on a, a, a pretty um, robust and, and a classic idea in computer vision, which is key point representation. Um, and I'm not going to belabor all this, uh, all this uh, uh, previous work, but the idea is if we can infer a uh, grasp point, function point, and effect point, three important point of each tool, and learn the key point of the downstream task, we can translate this very complex and high dimensional problem uh, from visual input into action space. And here's just an example of, um, you know, um, uh, showing how uh, in simulation the robot is able to um, infer this uh, complex thing and know how to uh, use the tool in different ways in order to perform the downstream task. Uh, let me just fast forward. Uh, Quan, how much time do I have? Or uh, am I over? Uh, I guess you can, uh, if, it would be great if you can finish in five minutes. Oh, well, I'll definitely finish in five minutes. Um, so, um, this representation of key point has another really nice uh, feature is we can assemble new tools because we can uh, infer um, how to use key points to do downstream tasks like pushing, reaching, and hammering. We can um, infer how to reverse configure a, a new tool based on the key point to perform tasks, um, uh, the downstream tasks. And here's an example of this newly assembled tool used for um, hammering. So, okay, so let me just do the last uh, uh, quick section um, is um, um, another thing that uh, exciting us are these long horizon interactive tasks. And this is mostly work with student Danfei and, and Silvio. And uh, uh, what is a long horizon task? A lot of you are working on this. So, um, but I think, uh, um, for me, this is a very exciting uh, area of robotics. And for Danfei, the most exciting long horizon task is making ice latte. And uh, here he uh, uh, wants me to show you six times um, speed it up how he, you know, making ice, ice latte uh, with a professional training is very complex. So um, I'm not going to sh finish showing you this whole video, but Let's just believe Dunfei can make really good ice latte from the initial state to this goal state. But the question is, um, what do we need to do to achieve this? Um, it's, uh, you know, the initial state and the end state is very different and has many choices along the way. It's very different from navigating a long, a long empty hallway. That's long, but it doesn't require that many different uh, state changes. So one natural way to think about this is to um, have figure out the linear uh, intermediate step. 
but of course it's not that simple. In fact, every step of the way, the search space is huge. There are the basic skills we need to uh, figure out. There is the object, especially complex object environment we need to figure out. There is the state of the objects that undergo changes. There's also the overall context and scene and, and 3D um, um, environment we have to uh, deal with. So this is multiplying this together. We have a huge um, prohibitive uh, search space. So, so the real challenge here is how do we plan in the combinatorial space of subtasks sub like object category, state, and scene conf configuration? How do we learn this and how do we uh, do it uh, in testing time? So the key insight that they has is to learn structured task representation. And that's the way to uh, control the explosive space, um, uh, uh, state space of this uh, learning. And, uh, and, and the one work I want to show you, uh, one line of work I want to show you is the one shot visual uh, imitation and uh, where the robot needs to imitate and perform a task given one single video. Um, again, there's a lot of people who have done this. I just want to make sure I acknowledge there's a lot of people uh, who have done this um, and uh, were inspired by many of these work. And, uh, um, so here's an example. Consider this cooking task that has many different subtasks and uh, um, that we have to consider. And to do it uh, in a sequential way is very difficult. And to try all these state in this sequential way is very expensive. So the insight um, we have is that we can um, actually turn this representation of task structure into a hierarchical program. And that reduces task space complexity. So our algorithm, the goal of our algorithm is really just uh, video interpretation and policy execution by neural program induction. And this is an idea that's rooted back to uh, robotics many, many years ago since the manual task programming days. And, uh, uh, but here, uh, what we are trying to do is um, through this uh, new line of work called neural task programming by generate, um, generating neural programs that will act as a reactive policy that controls the robot to perform the, the demonstrated task. And here's just an example of a, higher, uh, a learned NTP, neural task program, um, that, uh, that's trying to execute a block stacking task. At the top level, um, we're, uh, at the top level, we know we're trying to execute block stacking, but the program quickly traverses down to one important move, which is move, uh, okay, uh, which is to pick and place. And then it goes down one more level to pick and execute this uh, movement of picking. And once it's done, it, it, it executes another movement and once this is done, it knows to traverse back to a higher level and, um, and go to the next step. And by doing this, eventually through this hierarchical execution of a task, it can perform the, 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 the goal. Okay, let me just fast forward this. And of course, we have some quantitative uh, evaluation of our NTP um, algorithm compared to a flat or sequential way of execution and we show that um, for unseen tasks, NTP generalizes a lot better. But there is also a problem with NTP. It's actually very expensive, and it needs a, it needs a lot more, a, a lot of supervision. And uh, uh, what we want to is to have continuous strong generalization with weaker supervision. So, in the interest of time, I'm going to actually fast forward this. This is the follow-up work we have done since the NTP work called Neural Task Graph Inference as an intermediate representation in, inside the neural network to improve generalization with weaker, um, weaker supervision. It just roughly has two components. One is a task graph generator that takes complex video demos as input and generate the task graph representation. And then the second one is the executor, task graph ex executor that, um, that uh, is uh, essentially is a function as a re uh, um, 
uh, reactive policy, and the task graph executor decides which action to take based on the generated task graph and the current observation. And um, we have done this experiment both on a more toy block stacking um, 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 scenario as well as AI source um, um, simulation environment. And we, you see on the right that the NTG, the neural task graph, um, generalizes better um, than NTP and, and, the, um, and, the, um, and another baseline. So I know I'm out of time. Um, this is just to remind you that what continues to excite us is this loop between perception and action and trying to work on these interactive real world tasks. Um, you might be asking if you paid attention to my title that I promised babies, kittens, and octopus, and where is the octopus? Well, I want to end with um, an octopus. An octopus is an incredible animal that has a superb visual system and superb man manipulative uh, capability, manipulation capability. And this book by Peter Godfrey Smith is one of my favorite books on, on intelligence and octopus. And I just want to end with this uh, quote that the original and fundamental function of the nervous system is to link perception with action. And he drew this, as a philosopher, he drew this uh, conclusion through observing literally under, under the sea um, the lives of octopus and uh, has been inspiring, inspiring me for a long time. So, so that's the story of, of the three animals or, or, or three intelligent agents I promised you in my title. So thank you very much. Thank you, Fifi, for the fantastic talk. Uh, I know we are running over time. Uh, we, we got, uh, so we might take just one last question. Would that be okay? Yes. So we should receive two really long questions here, but I can summarize, summarize them very briefly because I know this is one burning question that has been asked by the whole robotic community. I heard this to be brought up for multiple times in the workshops yesterday. So to be short, what will be the next uh, image net for robotics? <laughs> and uh, do we know if we don't know, how can we figure it out? So um, I, 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 having worked on image net, I want to say that the most important thing is to have the humbleness that we don't aim for image net, but just to hunker down and work on something that's important. Part of the reason I give the first part of this talk is to quickly or briefly show the journey towards ImageNet. And I think that journey for me is the journey of searching for the North Star. Um, it's, not just, it's not about a data set, uh, but it's about a fundamental capability, functionality of perception that was innate to animals and especially to humans that led me to, to image that. And then thinking about how do we quantify that? How do we train that? How do we test that? How do we benchmark that? So I think, um, you know, whatever it is, I, I wouldn't call it image that. I, I think robotics is very exciting in its own way. So I would love to see um, the journey towards searching for the, the, the North Stars of robotics. Of course, there's already a lot of uh, hints, right? Like manipulation is a North Star. Look at the way animal, um, animal world evolved and look at the way humans evolved. M manipulation involves not only hands movement, planning, creation of tools and all this, but how do we quantify that? How do we create a benchmarkable language of that? I think it's a, a very exciting and, and collective effort towards that. Thank you, Fifi. That's a great answer. And let's thank Fifi again. Okay, bye.